Um, we have an announcement about, I'll, I'll let them do their Hey, did you hear about the Valentine's banquet coming up? Yes, I'm so excited to go with my sweetheart. Me too. I know there's a lot of single people out there, but they can come too. Yeah, and we'll have photos oh. with horses. Oh yeah, and we're gonna have some good food from Spears. Mm-hmm. It, it's on Saturday, February 9th. We're going, right? Yeah, sweetheart. We are too, right? You betcha, baby. Oh wait, I have to be there. I'm planning the games. <laughs> I love your games. They're fun every year. Well, I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> well, we're going to have some barbecue brisket, and we're going to have some sides. There's some little flyers out there on the table. And you can buy your tickets today after church. They're $10 a piece, so $20 a couple. But like Michelle said, you can come by yourself with your friends. That's right. Don't miss it going to be good food, good time, but you do need to buy your tickets in advance. And if you have kids that you need child care for, you need to sign those kids up so we know how many people to watch them. Good? Yeehaw! Woo uh, faith that works. You got to deal with this whole thing. We, we, you know, it's not enough just to have a uh, faith that we can say that we have, I have a faith in Jesus. But it's got to work in our lives as well. It's got to have an impact in our lives. You know, people go into church for years and years and years and, and come to the end of their life and they, they say, what did this faith that I say that I have in Jesus do for me during the time I was alive? Yes, it gives me eternal life. It gives me that glorious hope for that eternal life. But what does it do for me? What did it do for me? while I was alive, and, and they don't see it. They don't see the impact that it can have. And so we want to make sure when we're preaching about faith that it not only helps us in the glory to come in our way, but it also helps us in our day-to-day -day walk. How does it do this? See, our faith objective, our objective of faith, is a faith that works. And so we need to find this faith that is, first of all, faith that is set on a solid foundation. We want a faith that's solid, solid and real and we also need a faith that endures to the end that somewhere along the line down the road that doubt assails us and we just leave the faith completely behind we want we want a faith that takes us through those times of doubt through those times of difficulty through those times of stress and violence in our life so the faith that we have in jesus christ the one that we preach needs to be both aspects. It needs to have that solid foundation, something that is real and substantial, and it is also a thing that is a power that takes us through life. So faith is both. First of all, it is critical. Critical in the sense that it is an event in our lives. It is an event in our lives. It's an event that occurs once, but is so profound that it influences all the life that we have this time that where God moves in our lives in such a way as heaven and earth are changed because of that event that occurs. Now, some of us, <laughs> some of us have an event that we can point to. I can point to Jan December 31st, 1970 as the event that occurred that transformed my life. I was lost before, and I definitely was found afterwards. There is that event that occurred that I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord. Many of us have that event that we can nail down, maybe not necessarily to the exact date, but we know that happened in our lives. However, there are many individuals in the church that don't have that defining moment in their life. They grew up in the church. They, somehow it just, there's, the transition took place somewhere along the line in their lives, but I want you to be assured that your testimony, if you don't have a dramatic testimony of the transformation of your life, your testimony is just as valid and just as miraculous as the individual that does have that time where they can point to when their, their life was changed. But be assured of this, that there was a time in your life that God took and made it so that you were nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. You died with Christ. You were buried with Christ. 
and that you rose again from the dead in Christ. And you have now the assurance of that salvation. It is as sure as I have or anybody else in this room has. It is yours. Just because you can't name it. I was talking to a lady this last week, and she was saying, I, she hears all these testimonies about people coming to Jesus Christ. And she, she can't name a time whenever she came to the belief. And I had to assure her, indeed, don't worry about that. There was a time that God did this in your life. You may not be able to point to it. You may not, you may not have experienced anything that was so dramatic in your life. But it did happen. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today, if you have a solid belief in Jesus, then it did happen to you, even if you can't name the day. That's the first thing to understand. It is critical. It's an event that occurs. It is also progressive. You start as a babe in Christ and you grow to maturity. It is a process of life. A life filled of faith lived well all the life of the believer. It is a progressive faith that God has given us. Now, the critical event that comes into our way uh, is this. John 3.3 3 says this. Jesus answered and said to him, truly I, say, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is that time that you are born into Jesus Christ, that you put your faith and trust in him, and God makes this transition. Even if you can't name the day, it happened to you. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should have eternal life. That point in time where you know that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you have that assurance in your heart that Jesus has indeed given you that eternal life. You have salvation. However, what have I done here? I threw things all away. This morning, I, I threw my sermon away from yesterday because it wasn't, it was just too dry. And so I, I got up this morning and, and I came and I changed my sermon. So I don't know if it's going to follow the same. <clears throat> Let's try it this way. Each one of us coming to faith in Jesus Christ, all of us come from us, God in a different way. But we, God gives us a shared experience that we can share together that is the same for all of us. And this shared experience that he gives us is baptism. In Romans 6, 3 through 5, it says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. God gave us a, a gift, this, this thing of baptism, there, there are two things that he gives to us. is baptism and communion. Baptism is the critical event. It is the thing that he gives to us that shows forth what he does at that point in time when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That you indeed, God does take you and take you back 2,000 years ago and nails you to this tree with Jesus Christ as you believe in him. You die with Jesus. You are buried with Jesus. You are risen to newness of life. And that is exactly what we do as we come to this waters of baptism. On one side, you have Satan, you have sin, you have death. You have nothing to look forward to but that certainty of death and the judgment of God. And you come to faith in Jesus Christ and you believe in him and God transforms you. So you come to the waters of baptism and you show forth what God has done in your life. You are Lord in the waters of baptism, this person that is lost. And you are Lord in the waters of baptism and then you're raised to newness of life. That's amazing stuff that God does for us in the life. You see, there's examples of the conversions that we could go through. We have Pentecost. We have the Samaritans. In the Pentecost experience, Peter is preaching to the people of Israel. They come to faith. What shall we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized, each one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that, that was their experience there, that this following after Jesus, this believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Samaritans, the disciples went up to the Samaria, and they started preaching the gospel. They were baptizing people in Jesus, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit in their lives. And, and so the, uh, the apostles went up there, and they came to them, and they started laying their hands on the Samaritans, and the Holy Spirit came upon them with power and strength. That was their testimony about how they came to Jesus. The Gentiles 
when Peter came to the Gentiles, he preached the gospel in a miraculous way, drawn to these guys, Cornelius and the group of people that were gathered. And they started preaching the gospel, and these people put their faith and trust in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit came upon them immediately. And Peter says, what? we've got to be able to baptize these. You know, how can we not baptize these who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And God opened the door to the Gentiles, and that was their experience. The Ethiopian, he's going along, he's riding along on his, on his uh, chariot, reading out the book of Isaiah. Philip comes up alongside and says, what you doing? And he says, I'm just reading now the book of Isaiah, and I don't understand a clue. I don't have a clue about it. Can you tell me? And so Philip gets up there, and he starts preaching Jesus right out of the book of Isaiah. And the guy goes along, and he comes along, and he sees this body of water, and he says, hey, there's a body of water. What's going to stop me from being baptized? If you believe, you most certainly may be baptized. And so he, he goes down there in the waters of baptism, and the Ethiopian pops out of there, and he's just hallelujah, and so much that he didn't notice that Philip is just poof, gone, just miraculously gone. He goes on his way and goes back to Ethiopia and starts leading people to Jesus in Ethiopia. That's his message about how he involved in that. Paul, the Apostle Paul, breathing fire and brimstone against those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He's going up to grab a hold of those people. Somebody told me that I talk fast too. <laughs> Grabs a hold of somebody and he drags them. He's going to drag them back into Jerusalem. And the the light comes on from heaven. He's knocked to the ground with that whole thing, and God speaks to him. He says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm the Jesus whom you are persecuting. Arise and get into Damascus, and you'll be told what to do. By a human being, you'll be told what to do. Oh, my goodness. That's his story. And so he, he's a believer. But he's baptized three days later, his eyes are open, he understands these things, and he starts walking with Jesus. That's his testimony. The Philippian jailer, he's sitting there, he's, he's just doing his job, and the earthquake happens. He's heard these guys singing and all that sort of stuff, but he's falling asleep, and, and the earthquake comes, and he's going to kill himself because he knew that just all these guys have, you know, the door is open, well, let's go. And so he's going to lose all these prisoners, and he's going to be answered to that, and so he's going to kill himself. And Paul stops him from doing that, and he's so appreciative of Paul hanging the, keeping those guys all together for him. He takes him home, washes him up, cleans him up, and he says this, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Paul says, it, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And then he's baptized into Jesus Christ, and they start growing in Christ. The testimony of the Philippian jailer, the disciples of of John the Baptist. Another story in the process. They're going along teaching the things that John the Baptist taught. Paul comes along and says, what were you baptized into? And they were baptized in the baptism of John. He says, there's something greater than that. And he starts teaching them about Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and he decides to follow after Jesus Christ. And hallelujah, they follow the Lord in the waters of baptism there. They, see, each of their ex examples of Conversion is different in the scriptures. Everybody comes to Jesus differently. We all come to Christ differently. I came at the age of 20. Some of you came at the age of 5. Some of you came at the age of 55. It doesn't make any difference. Your testimony is your testimony. But we have this one shared thing, that we believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. And we share this experience of following the Lord in the waters of baptism. It is an amazing thing that God gives us these things in order that he might unite us together. He also gives us another thing. I said that the, the gospel going forth is both critical, our faith goes, is both critical and it is also progressive. God gives us a common experience, a shared progressive experience, a progressive help along the way in the area of the communion that we take. What he's showing there for us is an amazing thing. Jesus says this, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after he had eaten, saying, This is the cup which is poured out for you as the new covenant in my blood. Remember Jesus. You see, coming to Jesus Christ It'd be great to go home as soon as we believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. It is a great place to go to be with the Lord. But if we did that, nobody would be coming to Christ because, you know, somebody prayed to receive Jesus Christ and they fall over dead. 
that is not a good testimony. Hey, <laughs> you know, that's not what you want to see happening. So he gives us an opportunity to live our lives out as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ in this world that we live in. And he's not going to leave us alone. He's going to send us a comforter to come alongside of us. But we've got to keep our mind on our job. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That he died for us, that he was buried for us, he rose again from the dead, and he's coming back for us. And we're in this stage of from the time that he died to the time that he's coming back again. And we've got to live the life during that period of time. And so Jesus left us something that we can commonly share together around the table, this time of remembrance. It could become a ritual. Oh, it's just something that we in the church do. This is what we in church do. But it won't, doesn't have to become a ritual. As long as we are doing one thing, is that we're remembering Jesus when we come to that wa- the, the wine and the, and the bread, the, <laughs> the grape juice and the bread. We remember Jesus, what he did for us. We remember where we came from and where we're going. We remember our sins. And if there are some that are alive and well in our lives, we need to repent of those sins. We keep our accounts short with God. We keep it constantly, constantly, continually reminding ourselves of who we are in Jesus Christ, where we came from and where we're going. It's the shared experience that we have to remind ourselves to keep growing in Jesus Christ. Now, that was the shortened version of what I was going to preach on this morning that was going to be boring. I hope it wasn't too boring as I went through that whole process. This is what God does for us. He comes alongside of us and gives us help. But where I want to go to right now is the stream help that God gives to us along the way. There is things that we need to know about our growth in Jesus Christ. If you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you are a babe in Christ. There's some things that God wants to give to you in order that you grow up to maturity in Jesus. I was just talking about our Sunday school class that God has given us the church And in the church, it is not the building, it's not the organization of the church that's the church. That is not it. We are the church. We belong to each other. You belong to me, I belong to you. There is not just a pastor of this church. There are many pastors in this church. I just have the privilege of being called the senior pastor. And the days go by, I get more senior as we go. But nevertheless, that is the church that God is called. And we have this relationship there are evangelists here. There are, there, there, we are we're called together to do this in order that we might do a special thing, is that we might grow each individual up strong and mighty in Jesus Christ, that we come to the unity of the faith, that every one of us become mature in our faith in Jesus Christ and not leave a single person behind. Not leave us, not, that almost sounds like a political thing. That means we're not going to leave anybody behind in the process, that there is none, there is none that is left behind in the process, that there is none that falls short of the glory of God. That is what our job as a church is to do. And I can't do it by myself. The elders can't do it by themselves. The board can't do it. We have to do it. And so God does some things for us. And so I'm going to go to this this stream help that God gives. He says this, John Jesus is speaking in John, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because it abides with you and will be in you. That, yo, be in yo. Yes, I must have hit the button every, anyway. <laughs> going to be in yo. Okay, we're going to be in it. Uh, he's going to be in us, and it's going to be powerful. But you know when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, they did not come to them without preparing them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So when we're talking about walking in faith, we got to see the preparation that it needs to be done in our hearts as well. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and see what God has done to prepare the apostles for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And let us grab a hold of that as well. Acts 1.1, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And you all know I love the name Theophilus. And the story goes like this. 
when his, he was born, his mother showed him around, and they said, that's Theophilus looking kid I've ever seen. So they gave him the name Theophilus. Actually, Theophilus means God lover. That's a cool name, Theophilus, God lover. I'm writing to you, God lover, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. The first foundation that God gives to us that we need to have as believers in Lord Jesus Christ is to know what Jesus did and said. The Old Testament is great and it's wonderful and it is background stuff for the person of Jesus. But what we are centering in, and you'll notice I preach mostly from the New Testament, there is a reason why I do that, is because we need to know and understand the things that Jesus taught. When he came on the scene of the, of the, the, the church at that point in time, of the world at that time, the Jewish people did not have the mindset that Jesus taught. They did not have that mindset. He started saying weird things like, you must be born again. And that he was saying things like, that you're to love your enemy. He was saying strange things like, hey, forgive one another. He was, this is something different. He's saying, hey, if you're going to go and give things to God, your God is, your money is worthless to God unless you're right with your brothers in Christ. He was saying things that were strange. And we got to get to know all that Jesus did and he taught. Because this is the new way of thinking here. We're not in the childhood stage of life anymore. We are now called to adulthood. And God is giving we, the people of this age, the thing, very thoughts of God that we need to be able to think. And so we need to know what Jesus did and teach. That's the reason why we have Sunday school for our young children and, and the very same things. We want to build a foundation. We want them to come to Christ early in their life. That's true. But it doesn't make it doesn't make sense to just come to Christ and not know what, what they're doing. We're trying to build a solid foundation. They're singing. You heard it the other day. They're singing the word of God. They're getting it in their heart. We're establishing it so that when they come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they have a solid foundation being built underneath them in the word of God about the person of Jesus. That is marvelous that God does that. In Acts 1-2, until the day he was taken up into heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Two things in here that I want you to see. First of all, the thing that he said is that he gave orders to the apostles. He gave them commandments. He gave them things that they were due. Number one commandment is to believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the Father. Believe in Jesus. Second thing is love one another. With all your heart and soul and mind, love one another. This is my commandment that you do this. By all this, all men will know that, I'm, that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And that is key to the church. You know, we, God puts us together and we all come with all different sorts of backgrounds and understandings and hurts and damages. And there are going to be people that are going to make mistakes along the way. And if we wad them up and throw them away, we are no different than the world. And the world cannot tell the difference between a church that does that type of thing and a church, well, the world can tell the difference between a church that does that type of thing and a church that doesn't. The one that openly loves one another. That there is that place where you're welcome in this church with all your idiosyncrasies. This individual doesn't like this type of music. This person doesn't like this type of music. It doesn't make any difference to us because... We're making a singing one in one to God that we are called by his name to glorify him with our life. This person doesn't uh, like this color of carpet and this person doesn't like that color of carpet. It doesn't, you know, yes, we all have our opinions and, and we honor each other's opinions, but we come together and we are under the kingdom of God. And we are the saints of the living God. That's the first thing I want you to God gave us commandments. He told us to baptize and to teach. That's his commandments. So we baptize and to teach. We are called to do the things that God called us to do. And so that's a foundational thing that we've got to understand that God called us in front. You also notice that he chose them. There's not a person that comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that is not chosen by God. Very special, very precious that God chooses us. If you belong to Jesus if you understand that Jesus is the Christ and you put your faith and trust in him, God chose you from the foundation of the world to be his. You belong to him. 
because he chose you. You're not there by accident. God chose you. Acts 1.3, to these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. My goodness, are you convinced that Jesus rose again from the dead? It's got to be in our hearts and minds that Jesus actually did rise again from the dead. I was going on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, and one of the things that I, I finally dawned on me, I said, I've got to get this down right. If I'm going to go out and tell people that Jesus is the answer to their problems in their life, I've got to really believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. And I spent my time on my knees before God, and I came up from my knees understanding that Jesus Christ indeed did rise again from the dead. He confirmed it in his word. He confirmed it in my heart. I am a believer, a firm believer, that Jesus rose again from the dead. If he did not rise again from the dead, as Paul says, we are wasting our time and wasting your time as well. And we're wasting the world's time. If Jesus rose again from the dead, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. It sets him apart from Buddha, sets him apart from Muhammad, sets him apart from any of the other religious leaders of the world because that is God's mark of approval that this was his son. By the resurrection from the dead, he is the son of the living God. Powerful. Be convinced. Then in 4.5 it says this, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for that which the Father had promised, which he said, You have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He says, Hey, the Holy Spirit's a coming. He's a coming down the road. He's going to be the promised one that I said that is going to come alongside of you and, and help you and strengthen you. We have access to the very things of God. The very power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is in each and every one of us who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is what's going to happen in the process. So as he prepares us, he says this, but you receive power, this is 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, oh, wait, wait, no, 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 sorry, I'm going too fast. Acts 1, 6 through 7. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you were restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times of the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. There's some things you're not going to know. I'm sorry, they're, they're just I don't know some things. You ask me about those things, I don't know. When is Jesus Christ going to come back again? I don't know. I care, but I don't know. I do care where he, when he comes back again. I, I, it doesn't bother me that people fix dates. You know, this, Jesus is coming. We had a guy that just recently was, was saying that Jesus is going to come back at such and such a time. It's going to happen over and over and over again. The, the problem I have with it is it causes the world to look at that and just poo-poo us as far as Jesus coming back again. Oh, it's been going like this for forever, and he's never come back. All those times that they said he's going to come back, so... I, we, he's not going to come back. Don't be fooled by that. Jesus is going to come back. If G, God the Father has appointed a time for Jesus to come back again, and we don't know that time, and we are not to be bothered by not knowing that it is not the time for Jesus to come back again. We just got to get busy with what we're doing. See, <clears throat> he says, it's not for you to know this, but I'll tell you what you are going to have, and that's Acts 1.8. But you will receive power. You will receive power. Get your mind wrapped around this. You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given you the power of heaven inside of you. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Kansas is the uttermost part of the earth. We got there. But we're still got this whole thing of understanding that I am a witness to Jesus. I'm not, you're not necessarily an evangelist of Jesus. I remember when I was a, a, a young man, I, I went up to visit a friend of mine. He was living in a commune with a bunch of sociologists. And uh, I'm an anthropologist, so it's kind of like, oh, well, basically the same mindset. 
devoid of God completely in this commune here that I was going to, this house that some professor was running as far as that was concerned. And they were ridiculing Christians. Now, I was an evangelist at that time. I could barely look at a person and talk to them at the same time. But whenever they started ridiculing my Savior, I became a witness. I said, hey, guys, I want you to know that I agree with these individuals that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that he is indeed that. I can't tell you very much more than that other than I have come to understand there is a God in heaven. And this person, Jesus Christ, is in the world. And he is the Savior of mankind. And they left me alone. <laughs> See, I, I wasn't an evangelist. I, could, I couldn't lead them to Christ. I didn't have enough knowledge to do that. But I was a witness. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe the resurrection from the dead. So therefore, when somebody looks at me, they say, is that a Christian? I want them to be able to say, yes, he even behaves like one. That would be a cool thing. That, that's the reason why I don't put uh, bumper stickers on my car, by the way. Just in case I do something weird out there. I don't want people, people to say, oh, that's a Christian for you. You know, uh, you know. But, but I, so I don't, I, don't, I don't put bumper stickers on my car about my faith in Jesus. But I want to live my life like I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want this church to live its life as if it's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You really belong to him. But you have been given power to do that. In Acts 1, 9 through 11, it says this. After he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently in the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also, they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up in the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. You know, if those angels hadn't stood there, they would have stood out there and just been gazing in the sky, waiting for Jesus to come back. What is he telling them? Get busy doing what he told you to do. Get busy doing what he told you to do. When I got involved with the church, I didn't fit in. I didn't belong as far as my behavior and my understanding of life. But I knew that God called me to a church. I knew that God called me to be involved with these people. It took them two years before one kid came up to me and said, we decided you're okay. But that didn't matter to me. It didn't matter that they didn't do the music that I liked. It didn't matter that they didn't uh, do the service like I liked. They didn't matter if they you know, ostracized me or whatever it may be. They were my people because God called me to those people, and I was going to stick with them. I was going to stick with them. As long as God had me there, I was going to stick with them. I am called by God to follow him. I'm not called to follow a pastor. I'm not called to follow a special teacher. I'm not called to follow a church. I'm not called to follow a denomination. I'm called to follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. And that's where the church needs to go. In Acts 2, 15 through 17, what has happened here, they were prepared for the, God, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came. In mighty strength and power, the mighty rushing wind, the flames upon their head, and they spoke in tongues of different languages. And all these people came around, they gathered around because of all this commotion that was going on, wondering what's going on. If it was happened here in the United States, that wouldn't happen. Everybody would be watching TV, and they wouldn't even pay attention to what's going on outside. But down there, they didn't have anything going on, so they kind of went to what, you know, hey, let's go find what's interesting going on. Well, look at all, all this noise. So they all come down there expecting to find something exciting happening, and here's these guys speaking in tongues, speaking in the languages of all these people, and they're going, what in the world is going on? These guys are drunk. These guys are, are nuts. And Peter stands up, and he starts to preach to them. And he says, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. That would be nine o'clock in the morning. Early to get drunk, right? But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit 
on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Peter declared something on that day. He said, we are in the last days. This is the beginning of the last days of the life of mankind upon the face of this earth lost from God. And until Jesus comes back again, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, enabling us to be able to proclaim the saving grace of God until he comes back again. We are in the last days. Will, Jesus asks this question, will he find faith when he comes back again? And I want us to be able to say, amen. He will find faith. He'll find it in me, and he'll find it in you. You are the saints of the living God, holy and chosen by him, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, set apart for his glory and his wonder. That is the faith that God has given to us, a faith that's critical and progressive. Most of us, it's progressive right now. Some of you need to make it critical. You need to make a decision for Jesus today. But nevertheless, that's what God has called us to. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much for the salvation that you've given to us in Jesus Christ. The power of the word. We thank you for baptism as being an example and a, a showing forth the mighty works of God in our lives as we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We thank you for communion that can keep our accounts short with you, that we make it establish it as a very powerful tool in our walk with you. But we thank you for the Holy Spirit who has come to empower us to live a life that is pleasing and honoring to you. Surround your people today with your love, O oh God, and draw us close to you and that we may be able to glorify you all the days of our life and then when that day comes, when we're able to link arms together on that day with the rejoicing in our heart that each of us belonging to each other and belonging to you, what a glorious day that will be. We look forward to it, oh God. And we say with John, the apostle, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name. We're saying that now I belong to Jesus. If you uh, made a decision for Jesus, you want to want to follow after Him with your whole heart, then you come forward. If you want to join this church, you come forward. If you want to be baptized, you come forward. If you want to get have communion again, we'll we'll do communion again. Whatever it is that God is doing in your life, we want to be able to do that for you. In Jesus' name, we do. Let's sing. <laughs>